Hello and welcome back to the channel. This video is about Spomenik and Spomenik is the word used for monuments across the Western Balkans and in particular the region of the former Yugoslavia. I'm David, an Englishman in the Balkans and together with my wife Tamara we document our lives together living in this wonderful part of Southeast Europe. We look at daily life and our adventures and cuisine and well it's not a travel vlog but you can also find a lot of great places to visit especially here in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So if you want to subscribe please click the subscribe button and also the bell to make sure that you're notified of every single brand new video that we upload. So yes, we're talking Spomenik today. Some time ago on social media I came across something called the Spomenik database. Now since all the years that I've been living in the region I've come across some of these huge brutalistic heavy concrete monuments to um, events and activities concerning the former Yugoslavia. In fact one is near me about 40 kilometers away in the Kozra National Park and the nearest one is on the hill called Banberdo overlooking Banja Luka. It's an amazing uh, monument and apparently Tito who used to be the president uh, of Yugoslavia said it was one of the finest that he'd seen. So I've been interested in these sort of like huge monuments but somebody has actually created a database about them and has traveled extensively across the region documenting them. His name is Donald Niebel. Now Donald as you can guess from his name is not from the former Yugoslavia or from the Western Balkans at all. In fact he's from the United States so I got in touch with him via direct messaging on Instagram and said can I have a chat to you to find out more? He said yes. So the other day I caught up with him via Skype. He was in Illinois I think. I might have that wrong. But anyway I wanted to find out more about Spominik, about why he wanted to set up this very successful Spominik database. But first let's find out a little bit about him. Who is Donald Niebel? Well uh I uh, am a 38 year old uh, person who uh, is from Maryland uh, originally in the United States and I grew up uh, training to be uh, working in environmental science in sort of in uh, resource management uh, positions which I had done uh, over the years. I worked with the state government, local governments, federal government doing uh, various sorts of environmental management sorts of jobs uh, and I'd been doing that up until about a year ago uh, when I quit to pursue this project of mine full-time uh, and what this project is uh, is what I call the Spomenik database. It started in about 2015. I was interested in the monuments that I saw by uh, in photographs by this uh, Bel uh, Belgian photographer uh, Jan Kempeniers and he had taken these very kind of artistic uh, presented photographs of these very unusual looking monuments uh, that I of which I'd never seen anything like them before and I became very curious by them intrigued by them and in 2016 I went to go visit them uh, for the first time after spending weeks and weeks researching them trying to figure out how exactly do I find them? Where are they located? Uh, and after going over there for several months uh, between jobs, uh, I was moving from Oklahoma to Illinois uh, and I had a little bit of time off between work. So I thought I'll just go over there and uh, see if I can find uh, as many as I can. And when I got in through the process, I yeah, just rented a car when I arrived and just started driving across the countryside, typing in points on my sat-nav and going from point to point, learning along the way, talking to people, uh, having people explain things to me and translate things for me. And, um, and I came back uh, and I had all this information, all these uh, histories, all these uh, translated inscriptions and documents, and I thought, why don't I just put a little corner on the internet uh, of all of this material just in case anyone's interested and also so nobody has to go through all of the pain and trouble I went through the first time just to see these uh, magnificent creations and that's what I did and then as soon as I had done that I immediately started getting feedback from people not just in the region but all across the world who were just captivated by what I would put together and I kind of took that as um, 
encouragement to go further and further. Uh, and that's what I've been doing since then. You know, I spoke to somebody from the region here, from Bosnia-Herzegovina, not long after I found out that you created this database. And I said, I didn't mention that you'd done it to them. I just said, I'm interested in these. Is there a list of them somewhere in an archive in Belgrade or, or in Banja Luka or Sarajevo or wherever? And they, they hunted around and they said, no, there's, there's not one that exists. Um, is yours the only one, that, that the unique thing that uh, documents where all these monuments are? Even asking a simple question like that, you don't necessarily get a simple answer because, uh, you know, I, and I think that's kind of what frustrates people about the former Yugoslav region is asking simple questions don't get simple answers. For instance, asking a question like, what language do they speak in Bosnia-Herzegovina? Doesn't get you a simple answer. It uh, depends on who you talk to. Uh, and in the same way, asking a question like, uh, how many monuments are there? Is there anywhere the documents, all of the monuments? Uh, such questions like that are very difficult to answer in any sort of uh, kind of authoritative way. Uh, first off, because even by the end of the Yugoslav era, uh, there, were, there was no catalog of monuments um, across the entire landscape. Even let's just take Bosnia, for instance. Let's, let's exclude uh, the other former republics. Bosnia never did a, uh, a sort of catalog. Even during the entire Yugoslav era, Bosnia never put together a authoritative compendium of every NOB memorial site that existed uh, in that country. And uh, as a result, uh, it's not really known to this day how many existed uh, or exist today. Uh, there are a couple, uh, you know, some of the municipalities have local documents for their regions, uh, but some of other municipalities maybe had it at some point, but lost them over the course of the war. Those documents are long gone. So uh, in lo looking at just Bosnia, for instance, uh, uh, there is no complete record. And as far as the work I do, I by no means say that I have, that my website or the work I, do I have done is cataloging every single one. Because, uh, you know, if you look at all of the former Yugoslavia you know, some people estimate there are is somewhere between 20 to 40,000 NOB memorial objects. So that would be a lifetime worth of work, if not several lifetimes by several people to go through and catalog every single one. So my work is essentially kind of focusing on the ones that are charismatic, the ones that are most historically significant, that tell uh, the most, uh, the story of the region in a way that kind of encapsulates the region as a whole, that, you know, objects that are architecturally, artistically significant, that are larger than life, so on and so forth. I try to kind of find a way to contain myself because you can easily get lost in the enormity of it all if you try to bite it off too much. So I try to kind of contain what I'm cataloging and also cataloging stuff that I think you know, maybe international tourists or people from around the world might be intrigued by or could lead them on a journey of self-discovery for themselves. Most of the monuments are, and, and this is, I know, a wide generalized um, observation from me, but most of them are in the brutalistic, what they call the brutalistic style uh, of that era. So it's like uh, concrete on steroids. But some of them are absolutely stunning. And the one that I have yet to see in, in, in real life, as it were, is the one in Sudjetska, this like large gateway in the, in, in the middle of, of, of a valley. You know, when you show people that are not from the region, these brutalistic designs, we in the West, for example, we like things to be aesthetically pleasing. You know, it's almost, I don't know, it's like modern art for us. How, how, how have you found people that you've shown this to who aren't from the region when they say, God, don't they look ugly? Or do they actually see something 
special in them? I think a lot of times when you tell people that these are monuments, especially World War II monuments or, war, or monuments to massacres or atrocities, people in the West are often confused uh, because it defies their understanding of what a traditional kind of commemorative uh, shape is supposed to look like. Uh, you know, it's not something so straightforward as, uh, you know, other monuments, other popular monuments we might see other other places, whether it be, you know, Holocaust monuments in Poland or uh, other sorts of World War II monuments in the United States, uh, or et cetera, et cetera. Um, often, I think, people have this initial kind of confusion upon seeing them and then a uh, fascination by them because it's clear when you see these forms that there is an incredible amount of information that they're trying to convey, whether it be feelings or history uh, or ideology or uh, a sense of belonging or past. And I think people Many people, at least for me at least, have been curious to understand what that message is, to kind of translate this visual vocabulary into something that makes sense, that you can look at and it not be uh, necessarily just a kind of like when you look up at the stars and you see nothing but stars and just unintelligible points of light, but when you start to you know, learn about, let's say, the constellations or the universe, you finally can look at it and you can order things, make things make sense. And I think that's what a lot of people yearn for. And I think that's a, one of the reasons I put together the database and the histories that I have is so these aren't necessarily just, you know, these orientalized objects as many people in the past kind of interpreted them before I started doing my work saying, oh, look at these weird things that these weird people did. They're more, obviously, than just uh, abstract works of art. They're commemorative objects that uh, encapsulate a, you know, a shared history for millions of people in many cases. You mentioned that phrase there, a shared history. Um, going around and, and, and looking and documenting these objects, some of which are almost non-existent now they've been destroyed or you know hugely damaged to the ones that are still almost pristine in a way um, with the differences of opinion and I'm going to use this phrase it's going to annoy some people but it is what it is um, there's a certain amount of revisionism happening uh, in the region for example uh, that orchid I think it's an orchid at Yasanovats uh, where the concentration camp was, is some people will now say, say it was only a collection centre. As you went round the region, um, what were the reaction of local people when, you know, you went around with your camera asking questions? Was, was it all just love and hugs or did you have to cope with some hostility and negativity? I would say that generally when I talked to local people and explained to them what I was doing, it was often met with, most of all, just confusion. People couldn't for the life of them understand why someone would travel all the way from America to their small little village to look at something that had maybe fallen into neglect or this uh, this sort of kind of neglected object from another time uh, that that maybe is cared about in the community, but they couldn't understand why someone from across the ocean would, would care to travel so far to see it. Uh, and that was often the very first uh, encounter, you know, the, mo the majority of the encounters that I had with people. And oftentimes there were often people, there were people also that explaining what I was doing, they would be not necessarily aggressive, but very forceful in wanting me to understand what this object was, because I think they often would assume that I was coming from a place of absolute, uh, you know, ignorance as far as what this was or what it represented. And so they were very uh, adamant to want to explain to me what this was, to to put it into context for me, in you know, from their perspective. Uh, as far as you know, kind of anger or or any sort of meanness, I would say. Very, very rare to encounter anything like that. Although, you know, although I would say that I tried to, my best to be, you know, careful to avoid 
you know, situations like that, you know, in going into areas that I knew were very sensitive, I would tread very lightly and do my best to, you know, avoid doing anything that might offend people or that might uh, put myself in any sort of, uh, you know, unfriendly situation. So uh, I think for, but for the most part, I would say it was overwhelmingly positive, uh, overwhelmingly, you know, just curious or excited uh, and and very interested to know why someone like me was there. I've published a blog post in the last 10 days uh, about uh, Day of the Republic, um, 29th of November, when Yugoslavia, it was their, it was their Republic Day. Um, some of the reaction I got w from young people was, what Republic are you talking about? To um, quite an outpouring uh, on direct messages. Now, nobody put this publicly, but through direct messaging, personal messaging and everything else, especially on Instagram, uh, a, a lot of people said, I miss it so much. Uh, yes, it was a great day for us. It was one of the best holidays we ever had. Um, oh, to go back to those times, etc. So bringing it back to the young people, and for example, my wife's niece, who's now 16, has got no um, perception of what it might have been like. Grandparents only talk in, 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 in certain ways about it. Some groups here think it's a betrayal if they talk about their, their history. The database, though, has got a part, in my humble opinion, in education uh, for future generations. D did you see it as such a thing, or is it such a thing in, in your aim to be an educational tool, Donald? Oh, yeah, I would say very much uh, part of what I do is meant to uh, educate people no matter where they are, whether it be in South America or Australia or in Montenegro or wherever. Uh, there, I get messages from people, you know, I remember one I got not that long ago from a woman in Slovenia who said that she knew about the monuments that were in her local area, but she had no idea how many more there were across the entire former Yugoslav landscape. Uh, and so even people that were from the region are often uh, just amazed by j the vast amount of, of objects, uh, of monuments, of memorials, and all of their various forms and incarnations uh, that existed. Uh, because like I was saying, there weren't often uh, good compendiums across uh, the landscape to show what there was. Yeah, there were there were a couple books here or there that showed the biggest one, the most significant ones, uh, but you know there was no one resource. There was no one stop shop to sh show you, uh, you know, you know the vast amounts of hundreds and hundreds of sites that there were, uh, much less how to get to them, directions, photographs, uh, all of the information that I provide uh, on my website. I mean, a lot of the histories that I detail for individual monuments uh, sometimes are the first time that histories about a particular incident at this location has ever been written about in English, or the author of the monument the first time they've been written about in English. And so uh, I try to do my best to, you know, reach out and find this information and make it accessible to people who might not otherwise uh, have a way to locate it. I assumed, and you should never assume, I know, in the English language, because it makes an ass out of you and me, but I was assuming that the Yugoslavian state had funded the building of these huge monuments, only to find, from my research anyway, uh, very limited though it is, that the local communities foot the bill for these, and some of these Communities are quite rural, very small, uh, with not much in the way of income, yet people are very proud. My wife, for example, says, you know, my grandfather used to haul rock up to build the one uh, looking over uh, Banya Luka. So when you were going around doing the research, did people reflect that, that they felt that this was part of their community or had they forgotten about that in, in the mists of time? I think it really depends on where you go, who you talk to, you know, the people in just about every community uh, can have different uh, feelings, uh, remembrance practices, uh, you know, ways of looking at the past 
And even within close proximity, I don't think, you know, you can't necessarily look at just one former republic or uh, and say, this is the, the practice here. Um, it really depends on, indivi- almost on like an individual community level, uh, how monuments, uh, how memorial objects are treated. You know, they almost a- often act as barometers to how people interface with their own history. And I think that's uh, a unique attribute of these of, of the monuments in the sense that uh, they can tell so much. They, they act as kind of like a fulcrum to learn about not just the history of the region, but to learn about how people that still you know live in these communities feel about their own history uh, and how history, you know, the idea of history has changed. You know, what is memorialized, what is remembered what is forgotten uh you know there's just so much that 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 through the 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 world war ii monuments uh of yugoslavia so much that can be learned about the country the past the present um and so on and so forth you said that it could take two three four lifetimes actually to get all this all this documented um what's the plan to what's the plan for, for for donald coming back you, have you got more trips planned to come back to do more, or is it now just a pure academia that you have to um, take care of? Oh, I definitely uh, plan on coming back uh, probably in the spring. Uh, the last several years, I've spent at least you know somewhere between one to two to three months in the region uh, every year, and so I definitely plan on coming back again. I have uh, lots more people to talk to and meet a lot of colleagues to interface with i have lots of more monuments to see uh and even potentially do some events uh some talks and uh tours maybe even uh and uh it's it's uh you know just become this huge thing almost like an institution in and of itself the database that i've put together um you know i get emails from people just about every day that are just so excited about the work I've been doing. I just got, just the other week, I was in DC uh, speaking at the uh, embassy for North Macedonia uh, to an audience there and also at the University of Maryland. Uh, and there are just tons of people that are really excited and interested in this subject. Uh, and, and I think that if I can, you know, whatever I can do to help facilitate that, uh, I feel like is, is a worthwhile endeavor. I look at it as living history. Um, if, and as there are a lot of young people, and I say young people, let's say 25 and below, uh, that follow some of the content that I, that I put out from their own country because they're absolutely amazed that an Englishman would, A, want to live here, and two, talk positively about it. Um, Don, what would you say to young people across the region as far as these Spominic are concerned? Is it there's something they should be following, getting interested in, or is it, or, or do you just say do what you want? Well, I mean, I try not to go too much in far as telling people how they should feel about anything, uh, especially as someone not from the region. That's not my business. Uh, people, uh, what I want to do is provide to the people the information. Uh, the history as far as as I can interpret it uh, from my perspective, from my research, and and just put it out there for people to interpret as they will. Uh, You know, I'm not, you know, I'm not someone that's coming, I'm not a Yugo nostalgic. I'm not someone that's trying to uh, advocate reestablishing Yugoslavia. I'm not someone that says, let's bring back communism to the region. You know, I'm someone that's trying to do this from a documentarian perspective point of view that can say, you know, this history, you know, appeared to be, you know, dwindling, uh, to be, you know, these monuments were falling into a state of forgottenness oftentimes or neglect. And I just wanted to, you know, photograph them, document them, say, this is what I found. This is the way things exist in this particular spot. Now, this is the history that I found through my research about what happened here, what this object commemorates, uh, and I don't presume to tell anyone how they should digest that. This is, is simply putting out the, making sure the information is available to those who are interested in interfacing with it. It would be great 
for people to have some pointers of where they can go on the internet to find the content that you are creating, that you are producing uh, concerning the Spominix so they can do their own research as well and maybe stimulate them to meet up with you um, when you next come back. Where can people find um, the Spominix information? Uh, well, the name of my website is called spominicdatabase.org and I'm also very active on Twitter and on Instagram and on Facebook as well under that same name. So it uh, is very easy to just type in those two words and find out a, find a whole array of outlets to connect with me through. And also I respond to email very readily as well, info at spomanicdatabase.org. Uh, and I love hearing from anyone, no matter who it is, uh, whether you have feedback or opinions or just uh, input, uh, critiques. Uh, I always appreciate hearing anything that anyone has to say because uh, you know, even as much as, as work as I've done, I feel like every day I'm learning something and everyone has something that they can share with me to help bring me a closer to a closer understanding about, uh, you know, the region. I felt like I feel like it took me a good one, you know, maybe almost a good two years of just, you know, of reading and reading and research before I even felt like I had a kind of even a cursory understanding about the history of you know the former Yugoslav region as kind of like a general whole and and I think uh, it's so you know often when I'm talking to people about it people say oh wasn't there a war in Yugoslavia what was that all about you know you can't explain that to someone in just a few minutes it would it, you could take weeks <laughs> of anything just to give them a, a, a brief understanding uh, and so I encourage people, you know, just just uh, do as much uh, reading as you can, because I think there's so much that can be learned, f not just from the monuments, but from the region itself, uh, learning about the region through the monuments, uh, especially in this multicultural era that we're living in now. Yugoslavia was among the very first multicultural experiments uh, and I think seeing how uh, that all resulted in the end, I think there are many lessons that can be learned from consuming and understanding the history of Yugoslavia and what happened afterwards and how it exists now. Well, I really look forward to catching up with you when you come back. Uh, I'm sure we're going to keep in touch uh, and it would be really nice to host you here. Finally, here's, here's the uh, question that... Uh, I like to give people uh, one that might put you on the spot. Out of all the Spominic that you've seen so far, what would you say is the one that means the most to you? Obviously, that's always a difficult question. Uh, I think certainly one that is the most impactful that I hear people tell me uh, that was for me when I first saw it, that many say was supposed to be the showcase monument for Yugoslavia, the one like you were saying earlier at Sutjeska, uh, at the town of Tientista, uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina, uh, the one by Miodrag Zivkovic uh, is just absolutely amazing uh, to see it for the first time. But not only that one, uh, the one at Podgaric in Croatia is absolutely unbelievable. Uh, there are so many other ones that I can think of to say, to mention, you know, there's there's certainly, you know, the one at Drazgoja in Slovenia, you could say uh, Kozme in, in Serbia, uh, or the Macedonium in in uh, North Macedonia, uh, you know, so many uh, unbelievable ones that I think every, you know, uh, I've talked to people who are some of the biggest world travelers and they say exploring the monuments of Yugoslavia has been one of the most amazing travel experiences of their life. And so I just encourage people, uh, you know, uh, jump into it and you won't regret it. Donald, thank you so much for giving me your precious time today. Um, and please, if you're listening or watching or reading about this, it would be, you, you just got to get hold of what Donald's creating uh, and, and look at it and consume it. It's fascinating. Donald, thank you so much indeed for your time. Thank you so much. Have a great day. That's Donald Neville. 
the guy that has created the Spominic database, and I'm hoping that he's going to come back to the region early next year, uh, come and visit us here just north of Banja Luka, uh, tell me more, and maybe we can do some adventures and explore together. So that's it from this edition of the vlog. If you'd like to subscribe, please do hit that button. Also the bell to be notified of uh, whenever we launch a brand new video. And the things that we talked about in the video, the website for Donald, uh, the link to the Spominic database, etc, etc, are all in the description box below. So that's it. Until next time, stay safe wherever you are.